good morning. Welcome. So glad to see you this morning. As you can hear, I'm still not 100% voice, but we're going to worship the Lord anyways. We're going to give him praise this morning. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord this morning. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Let us stand together as we sing. Every 
Beautiful, wonderful name this morning. Please remain standing as Jason comes. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, the opportunity and freedom to come to your house to worship you. God, we ask that this morning you'd be lifted up, that you would be blessed in all things that, that, that we say and do in this place this morning. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Welcome to North Cleveland Baptist Church. It's so good to see you here. I hope uh, you've all had a great week. And uh, we're just looking forward to, to worshiping this morning together. Uh, on the way in, you're, you're handed uh, an evangel and a couple other things. Inside of that would have been a little registration slip. If you'll take a moment and fill that out, uh, we'll take that up a little bit later. Or if you want to do it digitally, you're welcome to, to scan the QR code. You can do that uh, from the ease of your, front, your phone right in front of you. Um, if you're a first-time guest, please bring your slip uh, your registration slip to Bart Starr in the vestibule um, after service, and he will give you a gift that I think you'll be pretty pretty happy with. So, um, again, thanks for joining us so much this morning. If you're uh, uh, 
this morning's a special morning because it's the day that we recognize our graduates. Now, we're going to do that in full in the 11 o'clock service, but for this morning uh, in the early service, I just want to call the roll for you. Dylan's going to shoot the, the faces uh, on the screen behind me here, and uh, we, it's just a great opportunity for us as a church to celebrate the accomplishments of our, our, our students and college, uh, college folks. And so with that, I'll begin with the, the college graduates. Um, uh, Lauren Olivia Beavers uh, graduated from, or will be graduating from the University of Tennessee with a Master of Science degree. Uh, Noah Elkins will be graduating from Lee University with a Master of Science in Nursing. Uh, Ms. Chandler Brandt will be uh, graduating from Cleveland State Community College with an Associate of Science in Education. And then Ms. Leanne Starr, and you're going to hear her name twice, uh, is uh, graduating with an Associate of Arts in Creative Writing from Liberty Online Academy. Now our high school graduates, Mr. Joshua Galloway uh, is graduating from Bradley Central High School. Uh, Mr. Isaac Hicks from Walker Valley High School. Mr. Andrew Lee from Ultawa High School. Miss Madeline Mowry uh, from the Home Life Academy. Uh, Miss Leanne Starr again uh, from Liberty University Online Academy. She is graduating with her uh, high school degree and the associate's degree. Um, and then Mr. Davis Wilkins from Bradley Central High School. So those are our graduates this year. We're so proud of them. And again, we will, uh, uh, we will recognize them in full in the 11 o'clock service. Uh, I don't usually pray twice, but I do want to pray a blessing over them in both services. So if you, you'll pray with me again, I would appreciate that. Lord Jesus, we love our graduates, and we're so happy to get to celebrate them today and their families and the accomplishments. God, and as a church right now, we just pray a blessing over their lives, Lord. And wherever their, their road takes them, wherever the path may lead them, Lord, make their crooked path straight, God. Father, you direct them in all things. Uh, you be with their families. Uh, Lord, as, the, as changes come, as, as transitions happen, Lord, you be with the parents, the brothers and sisters, and Lord, that uh, everyone who's walked through this path with them. In your name I pray. Amen.
to invite boys and girls to join me here at the front for our message to the children. Glad you got up. Stormy kind of morning. Choir was singing about God being with us in the storm, so I'm glad that he is. Come on up here close. I want to show you something uh, that I brought. You can tell me if you know what these are. Can you tell me what that is? You know what that is? Yeah? All right. It's, a, it's, a, it's not an oyster. It's an oyster shell. You know, the oyster lived inside there for a while. You know what happened to the oyster? Somebody ate it. Ugh. Do you like oysters? Oysters, raw oysters, fried oysters, oyster stew, you know, so uh, that's what people do. Uh, they like that. But something else can live inside the shell too because a little piece of grain or a little piece of sand can get inside that shell in there where that oyster's living, and that oyster doesn't like it at all. Do you know when you get a rock in your shoe, do you like that? No, you don't like that. You don't like that. It's irritating, it's bothering, and it's painful and stuff. So what do you do? You take your shoe off and you drop it and dump it out, right? But the oyster can't do that, so it has to figure out something else to do. And God gave it a special way that it covers that little piece of sand with some special liquid that it can make. And it hardens, and when that coat is done, it does another and another and another. And then somebody can open up the shell someday. And you know what they find inside? They find a pearl. Ooh, yes. All right, they find a pearl, something beautiful that comes out from something that was irritating and troublesome and painful. And it's just a little reminder to me that sometimes God lets some painful things come into our life that aren't pleasant and we don't like them at all. But with his love and with his kindness and with his grace and with some time, he can make something beautiful even out of something that is painful to us, and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So when we go through some tough times, maybe we're sick, maybe things aren't going too well, we can know and we can pray, God, I don't know why this is going on or how long it's going to last, but I want to pray that you'll use it to make something beautiful inside of me, okay? Let's bow together for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day that you've granted to us. Thank you for the wisdom of your word uh, and for the assurance that even times when the storms come, as the choir sang about, Lord, we know that you are in control and you can make good things come even out of hard times. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can go back to your seat. Psalm 121 says, I look to the mountains. Does my help come from there? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. The one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shield. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. Aren't you glad to know this morning that we have a God who watches over us, who takes care of us, who is ever faithfully on our side? Would you stand with me as we sing?
you join me in prayer? Father, great is your faithfulness. And Lord, every day is filled with examples of your mercies, of your miracles, and the works of your hand. And Father, most of all, everything that we need, you have provided. Lord, these are not just words to a song. They are the songs of our heart. They are the undeniable truths of your existence, of your faithfulness, of your undying love for us. Lord, as you have given us and proven your faithfulness and your love, we now have an opportunity to show our love and our faithfulness by giving back a portion of what you provided to us. I pray that you would use these gifts that we bring to you to do your will in your kingdom in the glory of your Son. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
I've become a child again. I've come back to the source of love, where healing can begin. Though the world would say I must. Good morning and a happy May Day to everybody. Happy, ha we made it. It's May Day. And I uh, did a little internet research, and if you will do the same, you, I promise you, you will exponentially increase your knowledge about May Day if you take about five minutes to look a little about, about May Day and how, especially in Europe, you know, it's, it's celebrated. We don't give it a whole lot of attention around here, but you know, some places in the world, it's a holiday. You get off work for May Day. How about that? And there's singing and there's dancing and there's cake. Uh, exciting May Day celebrations. And maybe even if you don't know much about May Day that you're familiar with things like dancing around the Maypole. Any of y'all going to do that today? Just wondered if anybody <laughs> observing May. Dancing around the Maypole. They, they, rent, they crown a May Queen. Uh, there are May Baskets that are given in some places, kind of like Easter baskets that are, are full of, of treats. So again, do a little research and we'll see what you know about May Day. But what do you know about May Day, the distress signal that takes place? What do you know about that? Take the gap out between the word May Day and the same thing, go to the internet, you're gonna learn a few things I did that I did not know. Fact is that it's May Day's birthday. Bet you didn't know that in the early 1920s, 100 years ago, happy 100th birthday, May Day, there was a radio operator at an airport in Corrington, England, who was asked to come up with a word that in early aviation, when they communicated by radio, by radio that could be easily understood for a vessel, an airplane that is in distress. And the aviator's name was Fred Stanley Mockham. And, uh, there he is, and uh, he, uh, he came up with the word May Day. He thought it could easily be heard, and because it's in England, it's early days of flight, a lot of flights going to and from France, I understand the word May Day sounds somewhat like the French words for help me, uh, and it bought traction, and it took, and it has absolutely nothing to do with May 1st, okay? No connection at all. I'm the one making the connection because I said, hey, Sunday falls, it's May Day when I was doing my sermon planning and what could we do to kind of create an introduction? So thank you uh, for bearing with us in that. But the truth of the matter is, as May Day is that calling for times of crisis, something unexpected, something dangerous, something distressful, has happened to you and you need help, you call out, I know that you don't have to be on a vessel for that to take place. Uh, that in life there are times unexpectedly, suddenly, distressfully, danger comes our way. Uh, for more than two years now in the pandemic, one of the unique things about it, you know, where our life just suddenly pivoted uh, of things of where we're, we're shut down and life has changed. The uniqueness about that is it happens to all of us at once. But understand, most crises aren't like that, are they? Most crises kind of take us individually in your family, in your home, in your life, in your work setting, in your community, wherever it may be, not on the grand scale. 
that would take place. Now, I hope on this May Day that no one's in crisis. Uh, and, but I want you to know that uh, you take your notes here on your green listening guide because the day's coming, right? Uh, no matter what, there's going to be that time when something unexpectedly, something overwhelmingly going to call that you need help in the midst of of that. And so we're going to look, as it says, you know, responding to a crisis, five things that are worth remembering. Because in these May Day times, these crisis times, our emotions just go into hyperdrive, right? That's the way God gave them to us. You know, we get super scared, super uh, fearful, uh, con concerned, angry at times. And God gave us those emotions, but he also gave us a brain. And so at times our brain has to process some things to help us so we're not just driven by raw emotions in times of crisis. So these are the things to remember, things to focus on, especially when you're in a time of crisis. The first is this. We live in a broken world. Bad things happen in the brokenness of this world. Peter writes in his first epistle, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Uh, crisis time, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? So Peter says, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised at these dangers and hardships that come. We want, our dream would be that life on earth would be like heaven. You know, everything goes the right way all the time, the will of God perfectly done, but we live in a broken and a fallen world. And we're broke because of the brokenness of sinfulness in our life, and the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, when sin enters in our world, it not only breaks Adam and Eve and it also breaks all of nature that is around. And so uh, the weather is broke. Uh, nature around us is, is broke. The ground is, is broke. And all the communities of humanity are broke. When we pull together, so we just face it and realize it and understand it. Our government is broke. Our schools are broke. Businesses are broke. Homes are broke. And churches are broke too. And if you want to find the brokenness of this church, you come see me afterwards and I will show you, starting with me, uh, about all the brokenness that does take place. God's will in this world takes place imperfectly and partially and sometimes not at all. And as a result, we live in a world where there is sickness and there is sadness and there is disappointment. Now, God could take care of all that real easily if he wanted to. All he'd have to do to get rid of all the brokenness and sinfulness in the world is get rid of us, right? <laughs> you know, just take out all humanity and it's done. It's kind of like you could kill the cancer, but you don't want to kill the patient. So instead of in the destruction business, God's in the redemption business, the healing business. And we'll talk about that more in a bit. But it's kind of uh, understanding, just a touch of reality. We do live in a broken world world. Now, a second thing to remember, especially in the times of crisis and the brokenness, not everything you hear is true. I can promise you out there somewhere today, uh, there are voices shouting and screaming, telling me how bad things are, how terrible things are, the sky's falling, chicken little all over again, how terrible and awful things are, and there's probably some voices telling you how great and grand that things are, and the uh, truth of the matter is, uh, we probably live somewhere it's never as bad as it seems and it's never as good as it's said to have been. And gosh, you know, we're in a election time and it doesn't matter which side of the aisle, the rhetoric heats up and it says, if you vote for them people, then it's going to be awful. It's going to be a disaster. The world's going to come to an end. And they're saying, if you vote for them people, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be awful. It's going to be the world coming to an end. And we have to be wise to filter out that everything we hear is not true. Now, we live in a world where there is more information. I mean, there's more information in the next 10 minutes you can get off your phone than your great-grandparents would get in a week, right? Uh, just that things that, that come your way in that means. And if you're old like me, you will remember a day that at 6.30 in the evening on the 
uh, television, Walter Cronkite came on, and he would give you the national and the international news, and he would say, sign off, that's the way it is. And we believed him, uh, and that was enough. You know, there was a trustworthy. But now we got all kinds of messages that come our way in the broadcast, in the podcast, over social media, over the internet, and we have to take the responsibility. It falls on us. It just goes with the times and the day. We have to take the responsibility to filter out what is true and what is not true. Proverbs 14, 15, it's on your outline. The gullible believe everything they're told, but the prudent sift and weigh every word. And I went to my online Bible, the international, New International Version, which I usually go to, and I had it searched for two different phrases because the newest Bible warns about this. I had it searched for false prophets, false teachers. And I found, at least in that translation, 27 different times God warns his people, watch out. There are false prophets. There are false teachers. And they're sharing things. They, they sound good. They sound true. Maybe they sound viable. They may even genuinely believe it themselves, these false prophets, false teachers. But be, uh, be on the guard against those things. And we know, we're wise enough to know, I think, that not every messenger is just trying to give us helpful information. There are other agendas that are out there. They may be trying to stir up something so a little bit more of a spotlight of culture falls upon them to get their brand out there a little more, somehow benefit by gaining their own audience. And, and news is oftentimes as much opinion as it is news, or maybe more so. So again, it's our responsibility to filter through those things because it says in Proverbs 13, 16, the prudent man always acts out of knowledge. So resolve that you are going to believe the facts and not the fakes and the fallacies and the fads or faulty statistics. Proverbs 18, 13, it is a folly to decide before first knowing the facts. Sometimes even in our pursuit of God's will and God's way, things can seem one way when truth is something else. And I was reminded in my preparation of one of the greatest heroes of the Bible, a prophet named Elijah. Uh, and Elijah had great heights, and Elijah went into the great depths. And one of those times, it seemed he was defeated. Uh, the king, wicked king and queen Ahab and Jezebel would, and marked him, and uh, he has one of those complaining prayers to God that I like that God is, can handle those uh, when we don't like the way things are. And look at how he saw things. It started in verse 14 of 1 Kings. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put the prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. That was what he heard. That was what he perceived. That is what he thought. But you go just a few verses when God replies to him, and look what God says. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. <laughs> uh, you thought that was true. Then God says, let me tell you what's really true. I've got in my back pocket 7,000 godly people who've never bowed down to that bell that, that you have been preaching and prophesying against. You know, uh, everything that he thought as good and godly as a man at that point wasn't true. And God helped filter him to the place of a greater truth. And you can always find something out there in this information age we live in. You can always find something out there that will say something that you want to hear. Say what you believe. And you know what else? You always find something that will say what you dread hearing. It'll be out there too. Not everything you hear is true. Third, this too shall pass. Remember, this too shall pass. Uh, I like the story of the guy who said his favorite Bible verse was, and it came to pass. You know, it didn't come to stay. The Bible didn't say it came to stay. It said it came to pass. Uh, and things do come. And, and pass. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that outweighs them all. Now, I'm sure that when you are in times of trouble, they do not seem light nor momentary, correct? 
in the midst of them, the heart of them, when you are grinding it out, it doesn't feel light and it doesn't feel like it's temporary at all. It feels like it's always there to stay. And I have found that one of the best things I can tell people who are grinding it out, life is hard and harsh and difficult and whatever it is, crisis that they're working to, one of the best things I can say to them in that time is, it won't always feel this way. It won't always be this way. And one of the places I learned that was some years ago, I was reading Tony Dungy, the football coach and now NFL uh, broadcaster, uh, reading his autobiography uh, about, and part of the story, tragic story, when he had a, a young son, prime of life, that died. And I couldn't find the quote exactly, but I got it pretty well paraphrased for you there. A friend came up to him and said this, your life will never be the same, but not every day will feel like today. And he needed to hear that on that day, right? Because he is in as deep of grief as you could possibly imagine the life of you having to bury your kid. Uh, it's not always gonna feel like today. And I have been at times, and I've been able to say that to people and say, trust me on this, I know this. I know it feels like grief and sorrow and hardship have moved in to stay, but this too shall pass. It won't always feel like today. And there have been times when people said it to me. I needed to hear it. And I, frankly, I believe them more than I believe me. I needed to borrow their faith to say it's gonna be better. A better day's coming. This too, in essence, shall pass. And two years ago, we were in the lockdown phase of the pandemic and it felt like it was here to stay in some ways and we hoped it would change sooner rather than later and we're not all the way out of things now but things are a lot different than they were a couple of years ago right it didn't come to stay it uh, it came to pass and of course other things will, will come again individually to us at times uh, they too have a temporary timeline paul says in second corinthians 4 18 we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And one day our grief is going to turn into joy, our sorrow into blessing. Uh, our May Day is going to be a someday when all is as it should be. And the Bible closes with this description of eternity in Revelation 21. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the older things have passed away. And that is our closure and that is there to stay. But until then, whatever the hardship we're in, this too shall pass. Fourth thing to remember, God will go through everything with you. God is our refuge, our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Prophet Isaiah said, when you pass through the waters, God says, I will be with you. You are never alone in life. Now, you may feel alone, but you're never alone. But God's presence and the feeling of God's presence, not the same thing. God is present even when we don't feel his presence there. And even this morning, I thought about, you know, sometimes this happens to us all. You know, all of a sudden, we will go, oh, I didn't know you were there. Can another person be present? And you don't know they're there all the time, right? Well, if that can happen with another person, can it happen with God? <laughs> can it happen with God? Oh, God, I didn't know you were, you were there. I didn't feel your presence. But I assure you we have the promise of his presence with us. And whatever scenario would take place, even the worst case scenario where our own life is finishing and over. A couple weeks ago, uh, I heard a devotional on the 23rd Psalm. And trust me, uh, a seasoned preacher, we think we have heard everything there is to say about the 23rd Psalm. And, and it wasn't anything earth shattering or, or breaking, but just the way that it was said when it comes down to the verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. I put that in capitals for, for emphasis sake. Just to say it was, it was pointed out and remind us that, that the Lord promises to go with us even from this world through death into the next world. And when you leave this world, you know what? You leave a lot behind. You leave your family behind. You leave your world of goods behind. You leave your wealth behind. You leave your body behind. But the Lord goes with you. He's with you from the beginning, and he takes you to his world, eternal world, to be with you. He promises everything to be with you. 
at my parents' wedding years ago when the recessional took place, the music that was played was, God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. That's a, that's a good launch song for a marriage. And it's a good thing to remember and a promise to take us through life. And then last, God is to be glorified. When something bad happens, when anything happens, we want to find out an explanation for it. We want to say, what caused this? What brought this around? What took care of this? And we can do a, a few things. One of the things is we can internalize and say, what did I do to cause this? Or we can blame and look around and say, what did somebody else do that caused this hardship? But there's a better alternative and to look forward into how can God be glorified. In this. There's a little story in John chapter 9. It's a story of Jesus healing a man born blind. And when the disciples see this man born blind, they have a natural question to ask there. It's on their outline. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? I mean, would we blame him? Is it his guilt? Or is he the victim of somebody else's mistakes? His parents must have sinned, and this is somehow the bad thing that resulted in that. And Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Of course, the story goes on that he is, he is healed. He recognizes he sees Jesus. There is glorification that takes place. And a good thing to ask in the, the difficulties, the mayday moments, the crisis times that we have is, can we have the faith to say, Lord, how can you be glorified in this? How do you want me to use this and redeem this for your glory, for your service, for, for your good? Something bad, you know, maybe like with the children's sermon, you know, that little irritant or a big irritant in the oyster shell. Uh, how can you turn in that into something beautiful? Because difficulties are God's, are opportunities for God's people to give him glory. And to be that way that we will respond differently than a lot of the culture and the, in the, the society that it is. Around us, can we keep our faith intact when our world seems to be crumbling? To do that is to glorify God. Can we keep our spirits up in those times? Can we believe that God is going to be working somehow, even in bad, for good? A Christian author named Philip Yancey, some of you have read some of his writings, uh, uh, would say in, in these crisis times of, of life and moments to, to look for the good that's taking place. Look for the people who are responding in the needs and in the tragedies. Look at the people who are going the extra mile. Look at the folks who are, who are crying with you. Look at the people who are, who are bringing meals. Look at the folks and look around at the people who are donating blood. Look at the things that are going on, the good work that's taking on, giving God glory uh, for that. Because God's in the business of taking that which seemed terrible and awful and bad and making it into something worthy of glory and praise and reverence and highest esteem. And to see that, all you got to do is look at the cross. Because you can see that, that cross, that terrible experience that Jesus went through, and that is the source of our glory and praise. And if you wanted to remember something this morning, this little summary statement that uh, I, I wanted you to include, so it's right there. The worst thing that ever happened, the death of Jesus, made possible the best thing that could ever happen, your salvation. And that is worthy of glory and praise. That the lamb who is worthy to be slain is also then worthy of honor and praise and glory that we give to him. That God be the glory when we understand. That God be the glory when we do not understand. And I'm not wise enough to stand before you this morning, my friends, and say when you go through difficulty, uh, I'm not wise enough to give you the reason why that happened. I'm not wise enough to say, I can't tell you the reason why hard times happen. I can't tell you why bad things happen to good people. I can't tell you the reason why God allows difficulties and painful things, crisis, to come into our life, to come suddenly, devastatingly, tragically. I can't tell you the reason why, but I can tell you the reason why it's not. It's not because he doesn't care. Because our God cares immensely. And he cares so much that he left the perfection and the glory and the ideal existence in eternity. And he came into our broken world in the person of Jesus Christ. And how did our world treat him? Despised him. Rejected him. 
nailed him to a cross to die tragically, painfully, violently, immensely more than whatever hardship that you and I are going through. And so in our times of difficulty, we say, boy, I hurt. And we have a God who knows what hurt feels like, right? He came into our being to hurt. Say, I'm, I'm, I feel alone. You know, he felt the rejection of man and the rejection of God forsaken this. See, but it's not fair what I'm going through. The cross wasn't fair. The cross wasn't fair a bit. The most unfair thing that ever took place was the cross of Jesus. Why would he do that? Because he loves us. Because he's in the redemption business. Because he's in the healing business. Because that's what would make right the perfect sacrifice, all the wrong and the brokenness in our hearts, in our life, and in our world. And so we walk by faith in that, that even in the difficulties, that we can see by faith the greatness that God is going to bring. And I got one more scripture. I didn't have it on your outline, but I put it here on the projection for us. And this is the promise we claim. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived. The things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. And so when the difficulties come, the challenges come because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because he entered into our pain for us, these are the things that he has prepared beyond our imagination, only revealed by God himself. Let's bow together for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, every life is in a different place right now. You know the details. You know them better than we do. Uh, and you know those who are in hurting times and lost times and, and, and times of grief. Times are just grinding it out right now. And I pray, Lord, to remember some truths to help them as they navigate through this. And if it's not today, it's going to be someday for us all. We pray, Lord, that in this our faith would be strong. Our trust in you would be sound. And it's easy to praise you when all things are going great and well. But help us, Lord, also to praise you and to magnify you in the difficulties. And so that our, our song and our voice and our heart will be, as we say in a moment, Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified. And in this moment that we have invitation, Lord, whatever response we need to make, whether it's come to the altar or complete some business with you in our hearts right now, you be magnified. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our song of commitment, decision, and resolve. If you have some decisions to bring to the front, you do so as we sing. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and skies, from rivers to the mountain tops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise, Christ be magnified in me, and oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life, and Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody in 
magnified and praised and glorified through, through our life and not only just the good times but also the bad times. Bible study starts momentarily so if you need a Bible study class to go to and need some direction, people in our welcome center uh, between this building and the next be happy to give you some guidance and direction. I bag the treats will be here at the front for the, the kids who want to uh, bring their outline and share that together. I uh, remind you First time guests in the back, uh, Bart will be there with a gift that he wants to give with you. Well, to the benediction, and uh, we have a benediction today. There it is. Oh, I can even see it on the back. This is good for those of you who were last week. Uh, we have a little, little ish, <coughs> issue uh, with the benediction. So uh, say it with me, beginning with the reference. Jude 24 through 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Happy May Day, everybody. Amen.